Judges chapter 5, and we're going to actually go through the whole chapter, so I'm not going to read it through and then go back. We're just going to take chunks of it at a time. So uh, I'm going to start with verses 1 through 5 in chapter 5. Please listen carefully, but this is God's word. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinam, sang on that day, saying, When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princesses. I, even I, was sing to the Lord. I was sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord. Then Sinai before the Lord, this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. So ends the reading. So Deborah is to be understood as the main speaker, even though Barak does add some stuff in here. But the one thing is, when Deborah says in uh, verse 3, she says, I was seeing praise to the Lord God of Israel. That word I is what you call in Hebrew a double emphatic pronoun. And that's important because it's illustrating the fact that she has to sing. She's saying, I have to sing. I have this in my heart and I have to give praise to God. And so what that is, is because of regeneration, because she's born again, she has this desire and longing to praise God in every aspect of her life. And that's what's happening with us. When we're born again and we have that new nature, you know, you can talk about, well, free will all you want. Your will now is to please God. Your will has been changed. Your will has been taken. The shackles of sin have been undone from your will. And now you want to please God. You can't help but praise Him. You can't help but meditate on Him. And this is what's happening with Deborah. She has to sing. She wants to sing. That's her new desire to praise God. And, you know, in Hebrew, you have a word. It's halak, H-A-L-A-K. And that's a word that's always used to describe a believer's walk. A believer's walk of faith in life. I guess in Greek you would probably have the word hodos, which is way. You know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, in Acts, I don't can't think of the chapter in Acts, but they say these are the people of the way. You know, these Christians are of the way. And what it's saying is, when you're a believer, you have a consistent manner of life. And that's what's going on with, with Deborah. She has this consistent manner of life. She's walking the path of faith, and she can't help but, but uh, praise the Lord. And, you know, in, in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 1, this is a good example of this. Ephesians chapter 2, actually 1 and 2, it says, And you he made alive. Wow. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. It's you he made alive. You became born again when you were dead in sin. It's God that does it. But look at verse 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So it's that word walk. When you once walked after the course of the world. Well, now, when you're a believer, you walk consistently in the paths of righteousness, in the path of faith. So Deborah, she leads this, this song of thanksgiving, but notice what her focus is. Her focus is entirely on God. Matter of fact, the words that are being used deliberately match how God went before his people on Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where God gave the Ten Commandments. Mount Sinai is where when they came out of Egypt, they came to the foot of the Mount Sinai and was too holy to even approach. Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments. But what was happening on top of the mountain? There was thunderings and lightnings and, and God's presence was there. Well, the same God, this is what Deborah is saying, the same God who came on Mount Sinai 
comes again and again to deliver his people. Have you ever thought about that? The same God that gave the Ten Commandments to Moses to give to the people, the same God that saw the thunderings and lightnings is in, involved in your life. God never changes, right? I am the same today, yesterday, and forever. So the same God that manifested himself on Mount Sinai, the same God, Jesus Christ, who spoke to Moses from the burning bush, speaks to you today through his word, through circumstances, through your new nature being born again. It's the Lord who delivered them at the Red Seas, which he's saying, also rescued us at the waters of Megiddo, which we'll see in verse 19. The God who came at Mount Sinai comes also at Mount Tabor. You saw that last week in verse 14 and 15. All she's saying is, the same God that delivers the people of Israel delivers us in our present day circumstances. And what the song's also doing, it's contrasting Baal, who's a false God, who most people, especially around Israel, thought controlled nature. Baal is the one that controlled the storms, the earth, the heavens, and the floods. But our praise is lifted to Yahweh. Our praise is lifted to Jehovah. Jehovah, matter of fact, is the word for the Lord, Jesus. Jehovah is the word that they took from the Old Testament, and it means Septuagint, it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and they have Lord there, the Adonai. That's the word that's always described in Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus is Jehovah. Think about this. But anyway, I digress. Our praise is lifted up to God, this God, who controls the forces of nature. And you get this, you get this illustration throughout the Old Testament. Of, you know, you might have read where God is riding on the clouds. Let me read a couple of them. Actually, Deuteronomy. I think in, you know, we see what's going on in, in Israel, right? So maybe it's timely to go through Judges. Judges is a violent book. The Bible is violent at times. The world is violent. But you know what? God, is he's in control of everything. The Holy One is sitting above and he has to he's watching this and he's, in, he's acting, especially in his people's lives. But when you go to Deuteronomy 33 yeah, it's 33, verse 2 and he said and this is Moses the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir, is what we just read. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 of his saints from his right hand, and came a fiery law for them. You go to verses 26 through 29 in the same chapter. It says, There is no one like the God of Jeshurun, who rides the heavens to help you, and his excellencies on the clouds. Let me stop there for a minute. It's not Baal controlling. It's not Mother Earth controlling nature. It's God. The God of the Bible controls nature. And he's riding on the clouds. What does that remind you of? In Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. And they say you see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And that's what Jesus said in his trial. You will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. He's saying you will see me coming in the clouds. That's always a metaphor for God. That's why the, the, they tore their robes and wanted to crucify Jesus because he was claiming to be God, not only there, but in many places throughout the New Testament. But let me go and read verses 27 through 29 of Deuteronomy. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will save, destroy. Then Israel shall dwell in safety, the fountain of Jacob alone, in the land of grain and new wine. His heaven shall also drop dew. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. Your enemies shall submit to you, and you shall tread down their high places. That's the God that's operating right now in Israel. When you, uh, but here's this, you know, 
climate change. Oh, taboo. Let's talk about climate change for a minute. God has made us stewards of this earth, but we don't control anything. We're not. It's not up to man to save the world. Because what does God say after Noah's flood? You know, they just God just wiped out the inhabitants of the earth and saved the family. And then Noah, they land on the ground, and Noah sends up a sacrifice pleasing to the Lord. And this is what the Lord says in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Arrogant man's not going to destroy this earth until it's time. It's God that's in control of everything. In verses 6 through 12, uh, back in Judges chapter 5, it says, In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased, it ceased in Israel, until I, Deborah, arose. Arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods, then there was also war in the gates. Not a shield or spear were seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Speak, you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, and who walk along the road. Far from the noise of the archers among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinah. So ends the reading. So life in Israel was terrible. Whenever a nation goes through a war, you know, we, there's always war somewhere going on in the world. We have Russia and Ukraine. Now we have Israel and Palestine. War cha changes stuff. It changes the whole culture of the places in. And how many times was Israel in a war? Constantly. Life, so life was terrible. And, and there was no, this is what she's saying, there was no one, no one used the highways because they feared of being robbed. The whole community was seized with fear. And it seemed like life maybe was at a standstill. And the root of the problem for Israel was that, that they went after false gods. They were supposed to be the witnesses. They were supposed to shine the light of the true God to the surrounding nations. But instead, they would go out and be corrupted by other religions. So they're starting to experience judgment because they were neglecting their divine responsibility of being Christ ambassadors, Christ witness. So we have to look at America, right? Because we have turned our backs on God. He's the one that's given us freedom to worship him. Now we're being bombarded by violence, and at times it's not even safe to leave our own homes. This, it's getting violent in America. It's getting very lawless in America. And sometimes, though, this is the good news, sometimes when, it's, when, when God's people see how hopeless they are, they can start to appreciate the mighty acts of the merciful Lord. And so this is the recipe for success. Desperate people and a sufficient, perfect God play side by side that the desperate might find their rest in God. That's the recipe for success. So what has to happen in order for us to have success? It's kind of like Marcia said. I don't want to pray for patience because I know it's going to happen and it's going to be rough. Connie says a double whammy, whatever she said. It's true. It's 100% true. But sometimes, not sometimes, all the time actually, God puts us in dire circumstances. His people, because he wants us to be desperately dependent on him. And that's the recipe for success. If we're walking around puffed up thinking how godly I am and how righteous I am, that's 
God, that's an affront to the Holy One. So it's a good thing when he puts us in hard circumstances. It's to magnify him. He wants our attention. He's a jealous God. So what Deborah is doing here, she's looking back and, and seeing what God has achieved. See, see, now she's uh, discerning the current uh, situation and how different it is now from when it was a war-torn country. See, the, the white donkeys, when she talks about the white donkeys, that's symbolic for a return to civil order. And now people have freedom of movement. And that's all essential for economic well-being in a country. We have to restore we have to restore law and order in order for us to start flourishing again. But look at verses uh, 13 through 18. It says, Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Macher, rulers came down, and Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. And the princesses of Essachar were with Deborah. As Essachar, so was Barak, sent into the valley under his command among the divisions of Reuben. These were the great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings for the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by the inlets. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtala also on the heights of the battlefield. So when it's a reading, you might say like I do, what is she talking about? She's, first of all, Deborah singing praises to God. That's what we do when we come in on Sundays, right? We sing praises to the Lord. You know, okay, here we go, the sermon. You know how precious it is in God's sight that his people come gathered for corporate worship? That's precious, and he loves that. When we sit in Bible study and talk about the Lord, when you go home and you're thinking about the Lord Jesus, you're the apple of his eye. You are. You're his bride. And so I just had to say, it's wonderful. But this section of the song is, is describes and celebrates, I would say, the people that willingly volunteer to fight. And, 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 that, and she's going to also rebuke those who choose not to get involved with the things of the Lord. See, the tone changes in this song when it comes to the tribe of Reuben. They're described as, okay, they're described as having these great resolves of heart. But the clan of Reuben, what it's really describing here is there's, it's like this. They're sitting through endless committee meetings around campfires. They have this great resolve to do mighty things for the Lord, but in the end, they did nothing. In the end, they became indifferent. You see, we can have all the church committees in the world and have great results of what we're going to do, but we have to act on it. We do. Evergreen does. But I'm just telling you, that's what it's describing here. Reuben has this great motive to do something, but they don't do anything. And then you have the tra tra uh, tribe of Dan and Asher. They're described as trading with the Phoenicians. And who are the Phoenicians? The Phoenicians were like the richest nation in the world at that time. See, they... Asher and, and Dan didn't have time to obey God's call because they were too involved in making worldly wealth with Phoenicia. And that's a lot of us in America. We'd rather, uh, uh, look, we're going to disobey God's call here because we got to think about the stock market. We have to think about our investments, stuff like that. See, we've become a spectator, spectator culture. We've become, I'm not talking about us, I'm just talking about the whole population of America. We've become too comfortable with the gospel of grace. And we forget that this holy God carries out his will within human history. And he asks us, his people, to be involved with it. It's a, it's a blessing to be used by God to carry out his, his will in life. 
in verses 19 through 23, it says, The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought. In Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo, they took no spoils of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. O oh, my soul, march on in strength. Then the horse's hooves pounded, galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse Murrah, said the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus. Curse his inhabitants bitterly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to help of the Lord against the mighty. So ends the reading. So what these four verses are doing is they're, they're, they're revealing the battle from God's perspective, not from our perspective, but from God's perspective. See, Caesarea, he crosses the river. Remember how many he had, what, 900 chariots? That's what kept Israel in control there. But he didn't realize as he was crossing the Kishon River that he was actually fighting against the Lord. People don't realize that. What did Jesus say? He said, he said there are going to be many of people that think they're doing service to God when they kill you. That's what Jesus said. They think they're doing service to God in the name of their false god by persecuting Christians. Well, Sisera, he thinks he's doing the will of probably himself, actually, but some false god. But he doesn't realize that God is fighting against him. So what the Lord does is he sends a mighty rainfall, which causes a flash flood, so that Kishon is overwhelmed and the army many of his army, almost all of them, not only drowned, but their, their chariots get stuck in the mud and they can't go. But he, he manages to escape. And, and by the time that Barak and his men reach the banks of Kishon, the enemy has already been defeated. It's pretty much stand back and watch the Lord deliver his people. The Lord's always going in front of us. He's the one clearing our path. See, God didn't need their physical assistance. But he does require of his people commitment, loyalty, and obedience. Commitment, I mean, he, he's going to get the glory in everything. But he wants us there ready to do his will. He wants us to be loyal to him, not to the world. And he wants our obedience. It's not our obedience that's going to be victorious. I don't know how else to say it. Because remember what's happened. We're going to see in a second here. Caesarea uses a, or uh, the JL uses a tent peg to accomplish God's will. Shamgar used an ox go at. So don't try and think of how, what you can use to do God's will. Just be committed and ready to do God's will. And he'll give you the instruments that are needed to fulfill his will. In verses 24 through 27, it says, Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Blessed is she among women in tents. He asked for water, she gave milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She pounded Sisera, the, she pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet he sank, he fell. When, the, when Where he sank, there he fell dead. So ends the reading. So this gets pretty violent here. But you know, if you've been watching the news, they get pretty graphic of what's going on in Israel. And you know, sometimes you think, our sensitive ears in the West, do we have to hear this? Let's just stay in our little cocoon and not have to deal, because we're not war-torn, right? But a lot of nations around the world are. It's horrible. It's horrible acts that are being committed. And this one person I saw today on TV, she said, we have to keep saying it. People need to hear of what's going on. And that's what kind of uh, uh, Deborah's doing. She's celebrating the victory of the Lord. So because what's going on is sexual innuendo is being uh, described here. It, it's legs and feet are common figures for genitalia. Uh, 
So it, it's describing that Cessera lies between her legs. It's referring to a sex act. It's not really happening, but it's referring to it. And that word uh, dead in, in the Hebrew is the word for rape. So that's, what's, that, that, that's what would happen. And that, that same word can be seen in Jeremiah 4.30. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 30, it says, And when you are plundered, what will you do? It's that word plundered. Sometimes we need to hear this. Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. He uses this metaphor all through the Old Testament. His bride selling herself to the world. What does Jesus say in James? I think it's in chapter 4. James chapter 4 could be 5. And she says, he says, uh, If you become friend, yeah, here it is. Chapter 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you know that friendship of the world is, an, is at war with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. See, that's what Asher was doing, right? Try with Asher and Dan. But I'm just saying, there, there's a fine line there. Uh, but let me finish up with verses 28 through 31. It says, The mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Her wisest ladies answered her. Yes, she answered herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil to every man a girl or two? For Sisera, the plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter. Thus, let all your enemies perish, O Lord, and let those who love him be like the sun when he comes out in full strength. So the land had rest for 40 years. So ends the word, the reading. So in verse 30, when it says to every man a girl or two, the Hebrew word is literally womb. W-O-M-B and so it's saying to every man a womb or two it's describing violent rape in the aftermath of war that's what it's describing and Caesarea's mother comforts herself she's wondering why is her son taking so long oh I know he must be dividing the booty he must but the reality is See, we know, we're seeing it from up above perspective. She is, and she's wondering, why is my son being so long and coming back? So little does she know God's calling him to judgment. He's meeting judgment. And sometimes this message in today's culture needs to be said the re about the reality of death. And, and we pretend that it's never going to happen to us. Sisera's mother can't comprehend why her son is taking so long from the booty. And she says something horrible. Oh, he must just have his fill of women, I'll be polite, after war. Little does she know he's standing in front of God, being judged for his horrible life. So nobody gets away with anything, beloved. And you know, Someone may think this is really vicious, but it's not. It's pious. Many of us in the West cannot rejoice when God smashes oppressors because we've never been so oppressed. That's why many of us cannot appreciate books like Judges as we read them from our easy chairs in our warm, comfortable homes by our cozy fireplace because we haven't been through it. But make no mistake about it, beloved. If you're in a war-torn country like Israel seems to always be throughout history, and God delivers you from your enemies, you're going to be singing praises to God.